And one of the reasons was he always kept himself at the edge of what was technically happening in photography. So that he knew every new lens, every new device, every new film, every he was right on top of that stuff. Whenever I had any kind of film, any question, when I was working on a film, I'd go to, I'd call him, huh? If it was anything about the photography, I'd say, Bob, they're shooting this and it doesn't look right, and bam. He'd say, well, what, what's, he'd have an immediate, specific question, you know? Oh, well, what kind of uh, film are they using? And I'd say, ah, no, you don't want that. You want Kodak such and such. And you want a such and such filter. And you want, you know, his, 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 his knowledge was encyclopedic. So you don't become one of the stars of what you do, particularly as an artist. And I, I consider the best cinematographers to have been artists. Um, without, first of all, learning your craft thoroughly. 15 years to go from being an assistant to being a director of photography and job space. And without the artistic sense and sensibility to then apply it creatively. I said this in the last class, and I'll say it here. Any of you who are thinking of being filmmakers or thinking of being in the arts, anything in the arts, what you need to be successful in the arts are these three things. And they're important. They're the, they're the, they're the key to it. You need creativity. You need to have creative sensibility. You do not need to be the most creative kid in the room. But you need creative sensibility. And I can tell you, from almost 50 years of doing this, I've seen a lot of guys who weren't the most creative guys who've had extremely long, successful, and awarded careers. And I've seen guys who were unbelievably creative who didn't make it. Secondly, you need an overriding desire and passion to do it. I don't care if you're a cinematographer or an actor or a director or a writer or painter or a sculptor or a, a composer. I don't care what it is. You have to have a passion to do that which overrides everything else in your life. Quite frankly, it's why so many people in the arts have crappy personal lives. It's exactly why. Because their overriding obsession is their art. That's, that has as much to do with it as any one of these three things. The third one is you got to get lucky. But by getting lucky, I don't mean, you know, all of a sudden, uh, I'll tell you a great lucky story. This is lucky, and then I'll explain to you what I mean. Lawrence Kasdan, who's a director, writer, wrote uh, uh, one of the Star Wars movies, wrote uh, Indiana Jones, pretty much created Indiana Jones. George Lucas, He's going to have a meeting with Steven Spielberg. Steven's tied up on the set. And Lucas gets to his office, and Steven's uh, secretary leads him into the office, sits him down hall, he was her name, and uh, says, George, can I get you anything to drink? And Steve's going to be 15 to 30 minutes late. He goes, yeah, uh, yeah, give me, give me a cup of coffee. So he's sitting there and walks over to this. Steven had an armoire, obviously, one wall goes. There's a stack of scripts there. This is not what the hell I read a script. And he takes his script off the top and he starts reading it. 30 minutes later, Spielberg comes through the door. Lucas jumps up out of his chair. He says, My God, Stephen, this is the guy who has to write Indiana Jones. And it was Lawrence Kasdan's screenplay. Lawrence Kasdan had started out as an advertising copywriter in Chicago. He came to LA. He wrote this screenplay, the one that George Lucas was holding in his hand. And he came to LA, he immediately got an agent, because the screenplay was that good. And then he went a year and the agent couldn't find him anywhere. Couldn't sell the screenplay and couldn't find him anywhere. So the agent called, says, Larry, I can get you some work in television so you can make it done when you're out here trying to do it. Kasdan says, you know, I've already got one job I hate, writing advertising, but at least I know that job. So I'm going to go back to Chicago and write advertising for a while, and I'll work on another script and send you a second screenplay. The agent says, great. A year later, the agent's phone rings. He picks it up. It's Larry. 
He's going, you know that TV stuff you were talking about? He goes, yeah. He says, I think I'll come out and do that. The agent says, great. Kasdan gets on the plane. The morning he landed at Los Angeles International Airport was the morning that George Lucas picked up that script. Uh -huh. Now that's luck. <laughs> that is luck. Okay? And he was right. I mean, and the script was, was a script that, Lauren, that Kasdan finally made as his first directorial job. He wrote by oh, half a dozen major features before he ever got that script made. And it was Body Heat. The movie Body Heat. Great film noir based kind of story in South Florida. Great story. Great script. Great movie. That's luck. The kind of luck I'm talking about is this third factor. It's a little different than that. Although Kasdan had that too. Luck in the arts. Showing up in the right place at the right time with the right stuff. That's the key. So that means you've learned your craft and you're prepared so that when that opportunity comes, you can step up and do it. Because they don't give you a lot of second opportunities. They really don't. If you look at some artists, particularly if you look at music, oftentimes the best work a singer or songwriter has done is the stuff that, that breaks the work. You know, it's a thing that got them. And then they try to keep reaching that. <laughs> but oftentimes that's the case. And uh, so it's those three things. You want a career in the arts, those are the three things you need to have. And, and they're things you just have to, you know, either have or don't have the right artistic attitudes and sympathies built into you. I don't think you can create those. You can build them. I don't think you can create them. And those other two things are completely entirely within your purview. You just have to do it. You just have to do it. You have to have that kind of passion. You have to learn how to do it. And that's what Bob had. That's what he's on that is. That's what Bruce had. That's what he had that kind of career. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. And Ed's a good friend of mine. And I was happy to come out here and, uh, and do this. Do you have any questions? There's about five yeah, minutes left. Yeah, I have a question. It was. Yeah. I had a question about uh, Paul Schrader. Yeah. Uh, I heard before that he was never happy with how great he came out, etc. Well, I've known Paul for 45 years and we're real good friends. And I would say Paul is never happy. <laughs> that would be my answer. He's a, he's, he's a real curmudgeon of a guy. When he sold Taxi Driver, he was living out of the back seat of his car. In because he had that overriding passionate desire, man. He was going to make it to the What happens? And he did. And Paul's a real artist. And a lot of times his stuff isn't as popular as other people's stuff because it has a very individual point of view. He has a very strong personality. And in this film, we did Janice. We did this film for $1,400,000. No money. No money. Shot it down and shot it digital. Shot it, you know, with as much stuff free as we can they borrow or steal. But when you see that movie, what separates it from all these other low budget things like that that I've seen, the look and feel of it. And Jim, we talked heavily because we uh, watched the Streetcar Named Desire, and we focused on the acting with that um, with Vivian and, and Marlon. And we know that you know Marlon. Can you just tell us some stories? Because we talked about how the actor has to be able to borrow some of his own personal life yeah. life to give to the character. Mm -hmm. My godfather was a very famous director named Alia Kazan, and he started with his with his partner. The Actors Studio in New York, which has now become a part of the new university in New York, uh, which is one of the best schools in the arts in the country. And uh, but back in the day, when he had Actors Studio, whenever he'd send these kids out to Hollywood, the first phone number they had in their pocket was my father. And because uh, he and Gadge were Gadge is his name, and Gadge were great great buddies. And uh, my dad. Uh, 
co raised all the money to co produce a film that the Gad shot that was very personal to him called America, America. And it was about his uncle, who was a, a Greek Im immigrant and worked as a shoeshine boy in New York in order to bring his whole family from Greece to America. Um, so Gadge ran the Actors Studio. So we get all these Actors Studios guys. Monty Cliff was a good friend of the family. Brando was a good friend of the family. Shelley Winters was a good friend of the family. Newman, when he first came here, was a good friend of the family. Um, in fact, Newman stayed a friend of ours for years and years and years. I, I was raised around Newman's kids. And, uh, when uh, Scott Newman died from a drug overdose, and Paul decided to start the Scott Newman Foundation, Joanne Woodward, his wife, the actress, came out here to give the main uh, announcement and speech that night uh, because Paul couldn't deal with it. Paul could not get on the stage in front of people after all those years and all that experience and talk about the death of his son. He couldn't do it. And they picked me, they asked me to give the speech about Scott. And I was so honored at the time to be able to do that. But that connection started at the Sunday night movies at my house, at my folks' house in Las Vegas, were kind of famous in the movie business. And I can't tell you the people that passed through those Sunday night movies. And on Sunday night, we, we had a cook, you know, I knew that. It was good. And, uh, but on Sunday nights, my grandmother would cook, my dad's and Bob's mom. And uh, she'd cook southern food, you know, because we made a little southern. And I mean, she'd make southern food was to die for. And so everybody in town wanted to come to these Sunday night dinners. And there were often kids who were new in town there. And there were often after studio kids there, uh, Brando being one of them. Brando is one of the hottest individuals I've known in my life, and I've known him my entire life. And known him well. At dinner at his house many, many, many times. Uh, was on New Year's County with him when I was like 13. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I know him well. And he is the first actor studio philosophy. Is, well, I'm not an actor, I haven't gone to classes there, but as well as I know it to be, is to draw upon personal experiences in your life to create the emotion that the character is going through. And so when you see a film like Streetcar, that's what Brando's doing. Now, I don't know how Vivian Lee worked. Uh, do you, Ed? Um, I, I heard that she had, um, you know, she was bipolar and stuff. And, yeah, so and she it definitely crazy. comes across in the act. Yeah, she just nuts. <laughs> this is brilliant. Yeah, there have been some brilliant actors who are just crazy. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but, uh, but with Brando, it, it all came from, it, from personal experiences. Yeah. It's crazy. I can't tell you how I can sit up here and tell you Brando stories for hours. <laughs> crazy stuff he did. He was just nuts. But I had these weird... He loved my mom because he came from a little town in Nebraska, and my mother came from a little town about 15 miles away, Arlington, Nebraska. So he just thought my mom was the best because she made it out of Nebraska like he did, you know, from some little farming community and made it to Hollywood. And, uh, uh, he was great that way, and he was a great actor. <coughs> I remember I talked to I worked for Francis Ford Coppola in the Zoetrope Studios. This is great. He, he, when, he, when Francis had Zoetrope Studios, he took the office building, the old General Services Studio, in Hollywood, and, and in the office building, he put all these old timers. I was talking about Jean Luc Godard, the French director, had an office there. George Burns, the American comedian, had an office there. Gene Kelly, I had been Gene Kelly's personal assistant on Hello Dolly when I was in college, had the office next to me. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was, just, it was just a crazy place. There were all these old, kind of famous people, that, and then there were all Francis's friends, <laughs> which is why I was there. <laughs> And, uh, but Brando used to come by there all the time. He was just, he was just a storm.